I was in seventh grade when my teacher at St. Mary's Country Day School in Hillsboro, North Carolina, asked me and my classmates to stand up and state our religion. I will never forget the fear that I experienced, not because I was Jewish and not because of some latent anti-Semitism. I did not belong at that moment to a synagogue, and I felt uncertain about my identity. I knew I was Jewish, but my family attended the local Unitarian Church, a home to many Jews, especially at that time. When I stood at my desk, my cheeks flush, stammering out something about Judaism and Unitarianism, I felt a burning longing in my heart to belong. Everyone has some moment of being on the outside of a group looking in. And that is when one would need somebody on the inside to welcome one in and to help that person feel at home. I am so grateful that Judea Reformed Congregation in Durham, North Carolina was there for me and for Rabbi John Friedman who graciously embraced my search, enrolled me in confirmation right away, even without becoming bar mitzvah, I'm grateful that my parents supported me every step of the way. If I'm honest about my journey, it was always less about a spiritual struggle and more about seeking a place where I felt like I was part of a large family. I suddenly had ancestors stretching back millennia who had wisdom, stories, and traditions and cousins who lived around the world, a connection I could fully embrace in my travels. If it were not for that synagogue in North Carolina, I don't know where I would be today. It's not so easy for synagogues in 2017. We are three generations from the events that forever shaped what it means to be a Jew, the Holocaust, and the founding of Israel. Our Jewish narrative is less focused in the 21st century, even if the essential truths of our morals are strong and we find meaning within the cycles of life in the synagogue, births and funerals, b'nai mitzvah and weddings. Life at Mount Zion is vibrant and we do not take that for granted. Our current strength is in the sum total of hundreds of individuals and families making a choice to be here. And within that group, a significant subset committing time and talent to make being here really matter. In some ways, it is countercultural to join or to stay joined to a synagogue, to invest resources in institutions that build community. We all know of family or friends who choose not to affiliate or who no longer feel the need to do so. They are just fine without the organized Jewish community. They may feel Jewishly engaged watching some Jewish movie, reading, attending cultural events, eating certain foods, pursuing justice based on their values, or celebrating Jewish holidays with friends or family. They may feel that the synagogue did its job with their kids and now the kids are all grown up. Certainly there is nothing wrong with these momentary connections. This is a reality of privilege in some ways of modern life, of voluntary belonging. It is symptomatic of the many forces in modern life that are tearing away at the social fabric of belonging. Columnist David Brooks suggests four major factors. Global migration, economic globalization, the internet, and cultural autonomy. He gets that we like our autonomy, but he poses this question. In a globalizing, diversifying world, how do we preserve individual freedom while strengthening 
social solidarity. Many people, many of us want to be free, not tie down to commitments. Our lives are full. But in the quiet moments for those connected but not so connected, there may be times when communal ties do not feel as strong as perhaps desired. There may be voices inside our head like Saul Bellows, Henderson, the Rain King, that say, I want, I want, I want. And if I'm being honest with you, I worry that some of our kids, let alone our adults, think of Judaism as an activity and not as an identity. When the activity is over, there is no need for a synagogue. There is a huge difference between being able to declare, I am Jewish, and saying, I have Hebrew school on Wednesdays and Sundays, just like I have gymnastics or karate on Mondays and Thursdays. We don't just go to Hebrew school like we go to the gym. We attend because our sense of real grounding in this world is from our Jewish identity that provides us with narratives, with our values, and our rituals. They give us purpose and a connection with other people. As a colleague of mine said, Rabbi Ari Rosenberg, journalist Daniel Pearl's final words were not, I played soccer as a kid. They were, I am Jewish. There's a piece of art by Ken Aftekar in the Jewish Museum of New York City. I see it every year with Mount Sinai's 11th graders during their five-day exploration of Jewish identity, their tour of immigrants and modern New York. The work is called, I Hate the Name Kenneth. Kenneth was the closest his parents could find to his Hebrew name, Chaim, the artist explains. The art piece has photographs of his two grandfathers, both named Abraham, both from Eastern Europe. One changed his name to Albert to succeed at Ford Motor Company, where he retired as vice president in the tractor division. The other grandfather never changed his name. He worked at a bicycle shop in Detroit near a synagogue and called Kenneth Mein Kenny. Whenever the text is about this grandfather, Kenny is pictured within a full picture frame, completely connected to his family and identity. When the artist says that he hates the name Kenneth, the words are literally outside the frame in the piece, rejecting in some not fully articulated way his grandfather's assimilation and his turning too far away from his Jewishness. Aftakar reclaims his ancient new Jewish identity fully framed. Seeking a full frame Judaism does not always mean that people are ready to embrace community. Who knows what belonging actually meant to Aftakar? The actress Sarah Jessica Parker suggests in an interview for a book called Stars of David that she wants to belong, but needs the Jewish community to be a little less intimidating. Parker, whose father was Jewish, is married to Matthew Broderick, whose mother is Jewish. She says, I was saying to Matthew, if we went to the temple next door, where would we begin? In temple, it seems like you have to know what you're doing. And it intimidates people, it certainly intimidates me, and it, I keep saying, I'm not a religious person. But I know that's not true. I know that I believe that there's somebody that watches over us and he or she takes care, or not, or teaches us. I really do, strangely enough, kind of cling to that idea. And I think that for Matthew, he's just as deeply religious as I am, but he's cynical about it because he's seen that religion can be so harmful. Frankly, I've always just considered myself a Jew, she continues. Maybe I feel Jewish because my mother is skeptical of organized religion in general, and being a Jew felt more cultural to me. For Parker, when she considers her Jewish identity, it is located in questions, 
and in nostalgia, but not currently within the Jewish community. Two weeks ago, a Jewish slam poet, Andrew Lustig, came to Mount Zion from Brooklyn to be with our teens. He is young, he's engaged in the Jewish community, finding his own way, of course, and he recited here his poem called I Am Jewish, which has been seen over a half million times on YouTube. His sense of belonging is in his lived experiences. He says, I am the collective pride and excitement that is felt when we reach out and find out that that new actor, that great athlete, his chief of staff, is Jewish. And I am the collective guilt and shame that is felt when we find out that that serial killer, that Ponzi schemer, that wife beater is Jewish. I'm never asked if I have horns or a pot of gold, if I rule the world, or why I kill Jesus. I'm asked where my black hat is, if I really get eight presents for our Christmas, why my sideburns aren't super long, and if I've really never tried bacon. I'm asked what a gefilte fish is. I say, I don't know. I don't like it. Nobody does. But we eat it because that's what we do. I'm asked if my dad's a lawyer, and I say, no, my mom is. My dad's an accountant. <laughs> I'm asked if my grandparents were in the Holocaust as if it were a movie. Yeah, they were, but luckily they were also on Schindler's List. I am on JDate and not Match.com because, well, it's just easier that way. Andrew Lustig, Sarah Jessica Parker, Daniel Pearl, Ken Aptekar, each found meaning in different ways by embracing their identity and saying, I am Jewish. And when they expressed that sense of belonging, there was this existential, timeless connection to something greater than themselves. At once, it was visceral and tribal. This desire to belong is programmed literally into our DNA, social science teaches us. Throughout history, we have lived as tribes. Even when we exert our autonomy and leave the fold or stay within but don't work to strengthen the community, we often return in moments of adversity. In times of fear, we become a tribe once again now, alas, seems to be such a time. We have heard anti-Semitism sanctioned in our highest office. We have seen anti-Semitism embedded in many progressive causes for years, which too often use anti-Zionism as a cover for anti-Semitism. We have even heard the Prime Minister of Israel putting political sensibilities before condemning anti-Semitism in Hungary and in the United States. In some ways, I am truly saddened that rising anti-Semitism may yet strengthen Jewish life in America. Saddened because that is what my rabbinic school professor, Rabbi Kravitz, predicted. Don't worry, anti-Semitism will come back, and when it does, so too the Jews to shul. That's what he kept saying 20 years ago, and never believed it. This has never sat well for me. Many years ago when I took over teaching confirmation for a rabbi in New Jersey, while he was on sabbatical, I discovered that the entire 10th grade curriculum was about the Holocaust. It was so clear to me then as it is today. I don't want to teach be Jewish, because someday they will be after us, too. Be prepared. I want to teach my love for Judaism, to instill its ethics and its values and its faith. The truth is, belonging to community is a basic human need. The Jewish psychologist, Andrew Maslow, developed a hierarchy of human needs. He places belongingness right after the physical needs of caring for our bodies, 
and our need for security. Belonging does not need to have just one path. There is a range of engagement. Last month, the dean of Harvard Divinity School suggested that there are five dimensions. Number one, first, according to this Reverend David Hempton, is that to which we belong, not just affiliate with, should have some morally compelling reason for its existence. I call this the ethical component of belonging. Number two, belonging to an institution, as with belonging to a family, involves the acceptance of our own frailties and those of others in a spirit of generosity and mutual forbearance, even when we fiercely disagree with and irritate one another. I call this the human component of belonging. Number three, we cannot belong anywhere where we do not know that people in our community are being diminished or treated with disrespect. If others are feeling diminished, you feel diminished as well and act to help others. I call this the social justice component of belonging. Number four, a true sense of belonging comes only with a sense that our deepest longing for belonging is shared by everyone. F. Scott Fitzgerald writes that this is part of the beauty of all literature. You discover that your longings are universal longings, that you're not lonely and isolated from anyone. You belong. I call this the universal part of belonging. Number five, finally, we can't belong anywhere if we don't want to belong and take on the responsibility and commitment of belonging. As long as we are content to stand aloof from community with a critical spirit of detachment and disengagement, we will never belong. We may achieve a kind of smug self-satisfaction that way, but we will never discover the warmth, the heart, the spirit that belonging brings. I call this the responsible component of belonging. Belonging is this powerful word. It resonates with self-acceptance, with community, a sense of home, of somehow being where we are meant to be, where we can flourish individually and corporately. Belonging is deeply ethical, transformatively human, connected to social justice, rooted in a universal longing, and is something that each one of us must take responsibility for. Belonging is a beautiful word. It is worth striving for. It should be who we are. I want to ask a hard question. Do you feel like you belong? I pray that the answer is yes. I hope you feel your longings, your personal journey brings you here in a way that makes this place feel like home. For many of us, it is because our Jewish identities feel fully framed here in this space, in this community. For others, it is supporting our Jewish loved ones and finding community in a group of people who care for each other. For all of us, we implore in our prayers the sentiment of belonging. We say, Chadesh Yemenu Kekedem, translated as renew our days as in the past. But it really means renew our days in this time, just as you, O oh God, helped our ancestors renew their days in their time. Help us feel that our days are filled with the same meaning and belonging that they experienced. Or put another way by the poet Mary Oliver. Coming home when we are driving in the dark on the long road to Provincetown, when we are weary, when the buildings and the scrub pines lose their familiar look, I imagine us rising from the speeding car I imagine us seeing everything from another place, 
the top of one of the pale dunes, or the deep and nameless fields of the sea. And what we see is a world that cannot cherish us, but which we cherish. And what we see is our life moving like that along the dark edges of everything, headlights sweeping the blackness, believing in a thousand fragile and improvable things, looking out for sorrow, slowing down for happiness, making all the right turns, right down to the thumping barriers to the sea, the swirling waves, the narrow streets, the houses, the past, the future, the doorway that belongs to you and me. Slowing down for happiness, making all the right turns, the past, the future, the doorway that belongs to you and me. May we find in this liminal moment of renewal a real, ancient new home that is worthy of our belonging. May we each, in whatever way we need, return again to this place of meaning. Ken Yehi may this be God's will. Amen. <laughs>